They were called border ruffians because a lot of them would just simply cross the border from Missouri into Kansas to try to influence elections. You notice I use the word influence, meaning terrify free soilers. Actually, more free soilers came to Kansas, but because you know that border was right there, and this shows most of the big cities, it's right on the Missouri border. And you have that very weird kind of thing where you have Kansas City, and the biggest Kansas City is in Missouri, always kind of a weird little quirk. Pro-slavery people were called Jayhawkers. That's why Kansas is the Jayhawk state. And if you want to watch a violent college basketball game, go watch the border war between Missouri and Kansas. University of Missouri, University of Kansas, I guess is still pretty crazy. And they wore red leggings. It's kind of hard to see there, but those would be the Jayhawkers, more Jayhawkers, but the border ruffians have the advantage of the state. And they're going to fight it out on which can get the more people to get a constitution. Well, you don't need the exact date. Yes? I love the border ruffians. Yeah. Did, did I see Jayhawkers ranting? No. Backtrack. Jayhawkers were the free soilers. If I said they're pro slavery, I'm really sorry. Thank you. Oh. I didn't. <laughs> they didn't like they didn't like the name border up. Sorry, I didn't even catch thank you. I didn't even realize I said that. You tricking me? It's on film. Yeah. So the so did he Kansas just like the like Yeah, fighting between free soilers and pro slavery people. And it would go on till after the Civil War ended, actually. It was pretty nasty. Lawrence, Kansas. Yeah. So the Kansas Nebraska. It found the constitution, the Missouri Compromise on Constitution, or repealed the Missouri Compromise. We got another law that's going to find the Missouri Compromise on Constitution. The Free Soil Jayhawker City of Lawrence. Border ruffians destroyed in 1856. It's called the Sack of Lawrence. Now, free soilers are not going to hear a sack. They thought it was a massacre. Yeah, some people were shocked during this. It was not lining up and shooting free soilers. They blew up the Free State Hotel. That was kind of a big deal. Yay! Killed them. And this really escalated the violence. Free soilers, many of them wanted revenge as they saw to these southern tyrants, bullies. And one free soiler from Ohio decided revenge was necessary. John Brown. John Brown was over 16 feet tall and his beard was three feet long. That's a fascinating picture. Actually, that's at the rotunda in the Kansas State Capitol. And he did not look like that. That's the John Brown when he had a long beard as a disguise in 1859. But they drew that because that became like the famous John Brown. And that's what he looked like then. And for many years, that was my yearbook photo in the school yearbook here at Capitol High. Yeah. 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 Huh? This, they kind of look like a young Calhoun. Well, actually, people looked at it and said, oh, you picked Lincoln. No, it's John Brown. And then people got mad. True. That's a great picture. All right, so. John Brown, though, took retribution. And what he saw is these people will not understand anything until we fight back with the same weapon, terror. And so at Pottawatomie Creek, you don't need to know the date. I just put up there to give you an idea. It's four days after the attack of Long. I'm sorry, three days. This is the marker that's there. They attacked pro-slavery people. Three little cabins along Pottawatomie Creek. Now, these, these people were involved in real activity. They probably weren't at Lawrence. No one's really innocent in this. But what he did is they drug out the men and hacked them apart with broadswords. You know what a broadsword is? Yeah. Think about a sword about that long and about that thick. And the whole thing about broadsword is this. They would give them to artillerymen with the idea being if cavalry attacks, you would take a knee and then impale the horse with the big broadsword. Needless to say, no one's crazy enough to have a horse charge you and say, I'll take you. No. So that's why they gave them away. They just here. So that's why they had these things. 
But, yeah. So the Sacramore was the free soil was getting attacked? Yeah, free soil. Border rot beans attack free soilers. Okay, and then this one, the free soil is attacking. Yeah. Okay. And the thing is, this indefensible slaughter will become to southerners every nightmare. Potawatomi Brown became their vision of every northerner. Potawatomi Brown. Because they didn't see this. What they saw it as, you tap slaves to this, you have slave rebellion. Everyone got that. John Brown was going to be the southern vision of all these northerners coming down and starting slave rebellions. Yet three months later at Osawatomi Creek, and let's be clear about it, every state should have a quota of creeks with watomi in it. Osawatomi Creek John Brown and Free Soilers beat off border ruffians in a huge, actually the biggest battle of this whole thing, at Osawatomie Creek. Osawatomie. My great, great, great grandfather was with John Brown at Osawatomie. We fight for food. No, he was not at Potawatomi. At least that's what I'm saying. Okay, so <laughs> Oswatomie Brown would be this fighter for freedom, this defender of liberty. That would become the Northern vision, and John Brown is going to be an incredibly divisive figure. So here's Lawrence, Potawatomi, Oswatomie. It really depends on what you want to believe then. It becomes not what he actually did. It's if you're pro-slavery, or free soil. There's a lot of things like that in this world. So as Kansas is erupting in violence, it goes to the floor of the United States Senate. Charles Sumner would give a speech called The Crime, the Crime Against Kansas. Now skip the cartoons. The Crime Against Kansas. There's Sumner. Now, this one is attacking Southern support for border ruffians and their constitution. By the way, this is the next thing I'm going to talk about after beating Kansas. But you notice that? One of the new political parties. What party? Republican. The Republican Party will come out of <coughs> Kansas, Nebraska. Well, Charles Sumner, you like his picture? Like he's fighting, ready to fight. He gave a speech attacking the South for supporting border ruffianism. And, which, yeah, that's what he said. Senator Andrew Butler of South Carolina, you mentioned my name, as somebody that cannot be trusted and does not know the truth. And I am I have no real explanation for this picture. I can't. That's like a blue light. Well, by calling Butler a liar was an attack, a violation of his honor. And Preston Brooks, Butler's cousin, wanted to defend the honor of his family. So he walked onto the floor of the United States Senate. Imagine, the room is about this size. It's just packed now with seats. They're about ready to start building an expansion, the one they use now. Just packed. Every desk is really small. They're bolted into the ground because they would be ripped up, or uh, if they move them, I'm sorry, if you move them, there'd be no room. Sumner can barely fit in it because he's a pretty tall, pretty big guy. So he's on the aisle. Brooks, a member of Congress, walks into the floor of the Senate carrying his walking stick. His cane, imagine one of those big, kind of gnarled wood ones about that thick. He comes walking in. People should have known something was up because all his friends were in the gallery. They all knew. They walked up. Ready? This is for the class. For learning. <laughs> And he said, you, you have attacked the honor of my family. Prepare to defend yourself. And literally, while he was saying to himself, he starts raining blows on his head. Ready? <laughs> and then across his neck, we just bang, bang, with this big cane. Sumner tries to stand up. He rips the bolts out and then collapses. And Brooks just keeps pounding him. Guys try to rush to his aid. And Southern senators stop them to not let them come to their help. Up in the balcony, his friends start chanting, beat him, beat him, beat him. What happened to Brooks? No, 
God's law. This is the Congress. They have their own laws. So all he was was censored and sent home, where he's promptly reelected and came back. An admirer sent him thousands of new canes. And this cartoon would be one of the best out of it. Southerners like to say they're chivalrous, gentlemen, and look out. And I like this one too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, why, okay, so what did Sumner do to make him mad? Sumner attacked his cousin, but said his cousin was a liar for that crime against Kansas speech. Okay. His cousin was, was uh, Butler, Senator Butler. And, and Butler was just like a senator. He was a senator. And see that crime against Kansas, that's a speech. Yes. Quick run. So Brooks was defending um, Andrew Butler? Yeah, his cousin. So, like, his, but he saw it as it's our family's on. And. <laughs> well, this was the issue. There were two constitutions coming out of this. And they're going to vote on. And they're named, and they have gave themselves a flag. These are the flags. The Lecompton and Topeka Constitution, by whatever city they form. Does anybody want to guess? Just take a stab in the dark. Which one's the pro-slavery one? Anybody. You just want to like throw a dart at the board and see what it is. <laughs> Admit me free. They're not messing around with these flags. Here's the thing. How do you have an election? What does someone from Kansas look like? Do they look like somebody from Missouri, let's say? And when they had the first election, it was clear that thousands of people from Missouri came in. So free soilers didn't vote. The Lecompton won. But everybody knew the election was a fraud. They had another election, and the Topeka won one. This is the problem. Yeah, I had no idea you were right behind me, and I just thought swamp was <laughs> Who went? No. The president validates the election. And who did the doe face? Here's which one did he choose? Look on. Now, it didn't mean immediately, it was the gut, um, immediately that it was the law, Congress, Northerners were furious, and the fight would rage on for another four years, Lecompton, Topeka, until finally in 1860, Topeka would become the Constitution, the Topeka Constitution, and Kansas would be admitted as a free state. But the fighting raged on for almost six more years after that. So pretty horrific. Now, we got to move on from Bleeding Kansas because another big event happened. A new political party. Out of the ruins of the Kansas-Nebraska Act, oops, the Republican Party. And the Republican Party really is a hodgepodge. Most people think it was the, just that it came out of the way. No, it didn't. It was actually free soil Democrats formed the basis of it. They were furious at Douglas's Kansas Nebraska Act. And then Bleeding Kansas kind of uh, made them more vocal. Abolitionists, conscious Whigs were kind of like free soil Democrats. And then industrial Whigs. And these are the pro capitalist, big business parts of the party. The, Demo the Republican Party really tried to be kind of, in a way, tied back to Jefferson. That's why they chose the name Republican. That was Jefferson's party. Now, the business side, by the end of the 1870s, would take over completely the Republican Party. But that's not yet. Not yet. Remember I told you about the cartoon where the elephant came from? Right after the Civil War, the Republican built solid union. Crushing Democrats. And that's where it came from. That's where elephant. Yeah. So, um, Conscience Wigs, what's that what do you mean by that? Conscious ways it applied that they had a conscious or would they spread a slave. So they were closer to free soil. Okay. 
there, there's some differences, but that's that's the closest in, um, we would get to. It's only in the north. And their ideology or strongly held beliefs would become in many ways the northern ideology. Now, we said ideology before, ideology of strongly held beliefs that you hold on to regardless. It could be regardless of whatever arguments people make or regardless of the truth sometimes. This is what you believe. We all have them. Very strong ideologies can be important to form your moral and ethical background, but they also can be dangerous <coughs> if you refuse to change when facts might change. Well, more and more, this became the ideology of the North. What the North wanted to believe. <laughs> I can? <laughs> no, I'm I, I think I can tell yeah, you something. You're not gonna bring that back? I know. I was gonna I was gonna save that and make a make a make a diorama. So at Southern ideology it's more and more that positive good theory of slavery. That idea that our system is better for workers than the northern system. Now, we treat our workers better. More and more, that's how they want to justify slavery. Northerners, they came more and more to this Republican ideology. Not all. Yeah. What was the term for this? Positive good theory of slavery. And so, what northerners are saying more and more, we got free labor here. Now, free labor was originally that pro-capitalistic idea. But more and more Northerners are thinking, you work hard, the system in the North will reward you. And Abraham Lincoln became the classic example of free labor. A man who started out literally born in a log cabin on a dirt floor, self-taught, worked hard, made himself a lawyer, and then eventually a successful politician. And that would be a big deal when he ran for president. The free labor, labor ideo ideology. And what it meant is this. The northern system has opportunity. They used to say that all the time. Opportunity. That's why immigrants come here. And all you need to do in the north, we encourage it. We push it. We want you to show initiative. You show initiative. You show a little bit of creativity, guts, courage. You can succeed. And if you don't, well, that's your fault because the system is better there. And in the South, they stifle opportunity. If you think about it, in the South, that strict class structure, slaves. It doesn't matter how hard you work, you're going to be stuck in the same system. This is a northern point of view. Not quite like that. But in the, but in the North, we or you can move up the class or move down. <laughs> now, once again, it's not 100% truth, but... It's what they wanted to believe. And that's why they're free soil. Spread this system to the colonies. Did I say the colonies? To the territories. Well, I guess territories technically are colonies, but we don't call them that. Yay. Okay. <coughs> that's a Republican Party. Now, this all sounds good. The war and the after effects of the war, a lot of this is going to get blown up. Well, there's going to be one more party that's going to try. But the election of 1856, then, is going to be a really important election. You're going to have two new political parties, the remnants of the Whigs, and then the Democrats, who are now bitterly divided. And they would nominate Buck Buchanan. James Buchanan of Pennsylvania, another Dolphins. And this is something you have to get for the Democrats. Because of Kansas, Nebraska, the Democrats became more pro slavery. Free soil Democrats joined the Republicans, or a significant number did. So the Republican Party is going to become more of a Southern party and more pro slavery. So, yeah, they nominated a Northerner. But he's a Dolphins. Another Dolphins. Yeah. So the Southerners would become more Republican? 
Democrat. Yeah, yeah. As Northern Free Soil Democrats join the Republicans, that means the Democratic Party is more of a Southern Party. Because they lost a lot of North. What that? The Democrats became more Southern. Republicans are only in the North. And Buck Buchanan, and I know what a lot of you are thinking, and I'm just going to dash this right now. <coughs> no, it's not the Hall of Fame defensive tackle right there for the Chiefs. The sappy joke. Or no, that's a Miller running back for the Vikings. That's Super Bowl four. Buck Buchanan. Hall of Famer. <laughs> this might shock you, but he actually would probably not be the person that Democrats would choose in 1856. The most eligible bachelor in America, people. Okay. Well, Buck Buchanan is going to stick with this more and more pro-slavery. They'll say popular sovereignty, but everyone knows that means pro-slavery. Now we have another party. Not just the Republicans. The nativist party called the Know Nothings or the American Party. And they nominated former President Miller Fillmore. They're intensely anti-immigrant. The Know Nothing, I Know Nothing was a password. And they embraced it. They called it Know Nothingism. They embraced Know Nothingism. Know Nothing. <laughs> so, former president. Anti-immigrant, especially Catholic immigrants. And they had a polka. And I know that's becoming kind of like the big music of today, but polkas were really popular in 1856 too. The Know Nothing Polka dedicated to everybody by nobody. Yeah. They didn't like immigrants and stuff? Yeah, really hated. The word was nativist in its own. And this cartoon is from that era, and it's showing how the Pope is like sailing over on the Vatican to take over the United States. <laughs> Well, he's coming, people. Okay. And now the Republicans. They, along with the Know Nothing, are buying to become that other party with the Democrats, who are actually imploding, too. They tried another war hero, a hero of the Mexican War, the Pathfinder. And his name is, of course, by the way, great straw hat, right? What's his name? John C. Fremont. <laughs> it really is. Fremont. John Charles. Now, only in the North. He was not on the ballot in any southern state. And his slogan, you want to hear it? You have to write down. You just want to hear it? Free soil, free labor, free speech. Fremont. Okay, so... Yeah, it is. <laughs> Look how close the election was. Fremont is not even on the ballot in any of these states. So yeah, Buchanan's elected. But all these states went to that new party, the Republicans. But also, look how many votes the Know Nothings got. Not that many electoral votes, but the popular vote. And Southerners can do the math. 1856 election terrified the South. And this is what you got to get. They were terrified of a strong, free soil Republican Party. And they can win if they get all the northern states. If the Republicans win the North, they win the Electoral College. Remember, popular vote doesn't matter. All that matters is electoral college. And so, even if every southern state votes against them, they still have a Republican president. And it's not just free soil, because we talked about how they thought that was an attack. This is what we got to get to. What they thought was this the Republican Party, if it wins the presidency, 1860, maybe, they think 1864 for sure, because there'll be a new census and more House seats. That means more electors. If the Republicans win, they'll start appointing Republican government officials in the South. The federal government will become Republican, and they'll start a Republican Party within the South. That's what terrified them. If 
you have a Republican Party in the South spewing free soil, what would that encourage? And we're doomed. We'll have traitors within. So they're saying, I mean, they're already talking 1856. We might have to do a preventative strike now. <coughs> yeah. So in California, do they consider themselves as a southern state or a northern state? It's like kind of involved. Yeah, it's going to actually, since they're they're free, they're actually going to be more closely aligned here. But early on, there was a lot of, they still had that, a lot of Democrats were there first. But in the next election, they'll vote for like. And so they're still a free state. But everything's just kind of turning upside down. They were really scared. The Know Nothing Party would be kind of absorbed into the Republican Party. No nothingism. And so they start moving fast. In the Supreme Court, one of the most controversial decisions in history, Dred Scott versus Stanford, happened. And this is 1857. Dred Scott, Dred and Harriet, his wife, sued for their freedom paid for by abolitions, because they their owner spent over half of their life in northern states, specifically Wisconsin Territory and Illinois State. And these had no slave codes. And what they said is, we spent half our life there, aren't we free? You can imagine what a big issue this was. Well, Justice Roger Taney, appointed by Andrew Jackson, needs to stay on all through the Civil War, even though he's from Virginia, he's loyal to the country, Great picture, huh? He made a ruling that he thought would end the problem of civil war. He thought this will solve the problem. And it's this. It's threefold. You ready? Blacks are not citizens. So they can't sue. Now, no, that's not quite true. It's not clear. It's a gray area in free civil war United States. But, he kept ruling. In his ruling, he also said, slaves are property. The Constitution protects property. You can bring property anywhere. You don't need slave codes. You can bring your slaves just as you would bring your cow or horse to Illinois or wherever. And lastly, if slaves are property, you can bring them everywhere. There could be no laws restricting slavery. Therefore, the Missouri Compromise and the Northwest Ordinance unconstitutional. So basically, this is going to open up at least a good hunk of the north to slaves, technically. What he's thinking is this. We open up the north to slavery, no more sectional divide, no civil war, everyone hugs. You think that worked? Anybody want to guess? How did the north react to this law? Especially when they kept saying, southerners always talk states' rights. And then you turn around and have the federal government overturn state laws. How dare you do this? Northerners were furious, and Southerners were furious at the Northern reaction. Dred Scott would divide the country even more. This is considered to be one of the worst rulings in history, and in many ways it is. Whenever you hear anybody mention a Supreme Court case, they say it's a bad ruling, they mention Dred Scott. Regardless of what it is, even if they don't relate, they always do. Sorry, Roger. And then, to make matters worse, an economic panic happened. We're not going to go into details about this. It dealt with over speculation in railroads. That's what I put that sign. But the thing is, economic insecurity leads people to divide up even more. You know, tribalism. I start looking for more people like me, and I'll trust the other people even more. I mean, you can see that. You can see that. Today, we have a lot of economic insecurity, and a couple times in history, you know, 1870s happened again, 1920s, so on. And it's, it's a common reaction. If you're worried about where you're going to get your, or if you're going to put food on your family, then... <laughs> yes? Um, so those three, those three things that you just said, was that like a... No, it was part of the Supreme Court ruling, Dred Scott versus Stanford. And that Roger, I did it? Roger Taney wrote it for the majority. He was a chief justice. And so this actually shows the bank panic on Wall Street, and it's supposed to show uh, like financiers out in the street with their silk hats. And I just showed this for one particular reason. I think you all can see it. It doesn't look like he's fishing for hats. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. 
Watch. Okay. <laughs> the Lincoln Douglas debate saying, come on, they heal all of this. This is for the Senate seat in Illinois. Wow. How they get to Illinois? Now remember, Senate seats are still being chosen by state assembly. So this is not a popular vote. Lincoln will be chosen by Republicans in Illinois to run for the Senate seat. Stephen Douglas, the accomplished senator who's going to use this, after he's thinking, this will push me into the presidential seat. They did a series of seven debates. And when Lincoln received the nomination, he made this point referring to Dred Scott. A house divided against itself cannot stand for ever half free or half slave. It's going to have to be one or the other. I'm not saying which one. Now, he's making this statement saying we cannot continue to go on like this. Not that it'll be read a lot, but this kind of gets out as a northern point of view that terrified the South. Yes? On um, what party was Douglas? Or Democrat. And the thing is, Douglas is going to run for president. As it turned out, shocking everybody, so is Lincoln. Douglas needs to show he supports Dred Scott because he needs Southern votes, but he knows Northerners hate Dred Scott. How do you do that? How do you do that? You know, he can't do that. I know what you're saying, but he per he's not the kind of guy who can do that. In Freeport, Illinois, right here, he would give what's called the Freeport Doctrine. And in it, he said, I'm for Dred Scott, but if you don't want slaves, you don't have to pass slave codes. They can avoid it. Just don't pass the slave codes. If you don't want slavery, don't pass slave codes. So, what he's saying is, I support Dred Scott. Southerners should be happy, right? Northerners should be happy because he's telling them not to have slavery. Who's happy? Nobody trusts them. Southerners are not going to forget that. How dare you tell people how not to have slaves? Which, of course, that's obvious. Dred Scott is just so awful. Now, Douglas would win. But a few Whigs are thinking, Lincoln, moderate, unknown, so we could be a dark horse. We have more controversial Republicans. Lincoln, no controversy. Hmm. And Lincoln's highly ambitious and tall. Yes. How did he win the Senate if what was in the South didn't like the Senate? Say it again. How did he win the seat for the Senate when both the North and the South didn't like him? It's one of those things where after the you know when they look at him once run for president, but within Illinois itself, the Democrats there all voted for him. And then this guy comes back. <laughs> Who's that? John Brown. He decides we can no longer talk. We need action. And with help of some abolitionists in the North, he does a raid on Harper's Ferry, Virginia, which is now West Virginia, right across the Maryland border. And his plan was to take the weapons at this arsenal, they made weapons there, and start a slave rebellion. Going from plantation for plantation, freeing slaves, and going to the mountains. We don't know if he really, really meant to do this, or more just make a symbol. And he hesitated. He, there's, it's in the mountains, there's no plantations there, so nobody joined him. And that allowed Marines from Washington, D.C. to ride this not that far away. And they quickly boxed him in into a, in the uh, firehouse, fire station there. Marines led by an army major, small army. You went on the major? Robert yeah, Robert E. Lee, small army too. Huh? Well, we don't know if he really wanted to have the hell of a slave insurrection, but he's going to be boxed in. They would batter down the wall using a ladder, take him prisoner, and his trial would be a sensation where he's going to be tried for treason, but he turned it into a fight against the evils of slavery. And he would be executed, but the northern and southern views are going to be so polarized over John Brown. John Brown, John Brown, John Brown. And so, there's the picture of him hanging. By the way, the Richmond Grays were the honor guard, the militia from Richmond, Virginia. 
at its execution. One of the members of the Richmond Grays was an actor by the name of John Wilkes Booth. Mm -hmm. All right. Last thing we got to get. I know the bell rang. For the election, you just have to know that Lincoln was able to win, but he was a moderate, and the, or the Democratic Party was fatally split. And what was the first day you used to see? South Carolina. South Carolina. Okay, you're good. Sorry, I didn't quite finish everything I wanted. I blame society.